Hello and welcome to episode 60 of Refining Rhetoric. We are talking to Classical Conversations graduates, and today we're talking to Mason Foster, who teaches aviation at Louisiana Tech. He is engaged to his CC sweetheart, and he's got some advice for parents who want to see their children pursue their dreams. Let's jump in. Classical Conversation Studios presents Refining Rhetoric with CEO Robert Portens, a podcast where faith, business, politics, and classical education meet. Join us as we use the classical tools of rhetoric to seek truth in every arena of life. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Refining Rhetoric. Today, my guest is Mason Foster. Mason is a Classical Conversations Challenge graduate and a recent graduate from Louisiana Tech University, where he studied professional aviation. Now he's giving back to his school, serving as a flight instructor at Louisiana Tech. Mason, welcome to the show. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Now, Mason, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, about your classical conversations journey, getting into college, et cetera. Yeah, definitely. So um, we started uh, homeschooling, or my mom started homeschooling me uh, for one year without classical conversations. Uh, that was a train wreck. And that was a mistake. So, yes, correct. No, it, it seriously was. We were all over the place. We needed some some guidance. Uh, yeah, so um, we started up a, a community in our local town. And um, yeah, we, we started with uh, foundations. I had four years of foundations, three years of essentials. And uh, then I moved on to challenge, six years of challenge. So 10 years total in classical. Um, yeah, after that, I went to Louisiana Tech University, where I graduated um, after three years with a Bachelor of Science in Professional Aviation and a minor in Aviation Management. And yeah, now, now I'm here as a flight instructor. Now, how did you get involved in flying? Like, was that something, was your dad a pilot? Were you big into the Air Force or World War II history, or how did you get involved? <laughs> so I'm actually a first-generation pilot. My great-grandfather had his private pilot license. My grandfather had his private pilot license, but that was about the end of their pilot career. You know, they just kind of got it to uh, fly around a little bit, um, fly here and there. So um, pretty much, I, I would say, we'll start at the beginning. Um, yeah, so whenever I was younger, um, I... I just loved flying. I mean, any time. So my dad worked as a, um, he, he would be contracted out by colleges as a system analyst. So he would be on the road pretty much every single week. And, uh, hmm. and so that, it was really nice to have, um, that homeschooling and classical conversations to, uh, so that we could go and visit him. Uh, it made it a lot easier. Um, and so we would get on a plane, we'd go visit him. Um, if we went on vacation to like Disney World, anything like that, my favorite part every single time, always getting on the airplane. And I got to see, uh, you know, be above the clouds. And it was just, it was the coolest feeling. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, ever since then, um, I've just, I've had a passion for flying. Uh, my family would always ask me when I was younger, hey, what do you want to do when you grow up? And I would say, oh, I want to be a pilot. And, you know, when you're young, it's like, oh, okay, that's a far-fetched dream. But you know what? We'll let them dream. And then a couple of years later, it's, what do you want to be? Oh, I want to be a pilot. Oh, okay. Same answer. That's, that's, that's okay. And then a couple of years later, you know, they, when I get into high school, they were like, what do you want to do? And I was like, I want to be a pilot. And they're like, oh, wow this is real. Like that he actually wants to do this. This isn't a far-fetched dream. Um, so yeah, I mean, just my entire life, I've always dreamed of it and uh, I'm glad it could definitely become a reality now. So did you, uh, start, uh, becoming a pilot during high school? Like, did you take classes or did you wait till you were in college to start that process? Yeah. So I went to my local flight school, um, and, I did my private training. I was able to, um, my grandfather wanted to make sure that I was actually serious about this because I had never been in a small plane before. So how do you know if he actually wants to do it or not? So um, he said that he would pay for it if I wanted to go get my private license. And so at 17 years old, I did all my training and uh, got my private pilot license uh, out at my local airport. And uh, after that, I went to Louisiana Tech where they accepted that as a uh, kind of credit. I got eight credit course hours and I just moved straight to the next step instead of having to go back and do that over again. Nice. What was the scariest part about learning how to fly? 
definitely landing, I would say. Landing is uh, a, a little sketchy when you're just hurtling at the ground at you know 70 miles an hour and you're trying to do 10 things at once and then level off and flare and all this. Um, it can get a little scary, a little sketchy, but um, but I, I had a really good instructor who uh, kind of walked me through the steps of it. Now, have you ever been close to crashing? Um, a couple times, yeah, maybe maybe once or twice. Um, nothing, I guess, too serious, but you know, almost stalling out on up above the runway. A um, couple couple other times, but nothing too too serious. Now tell me about, uh, you know, you're classically educated and you're a pilot. How did the classical education methodology help you get your pilot's license as a high school student? Hmm. Yeah. You feel um, like you were prepared to take the exams and do all the studying or um, less prepared than maybe other people in the class? No, absolutely. Um, it helped out a lot. I, I watched a lot of my friends um, kind of struggle with uh, – pacing themselves with their schoolwork and pacing themselves with their knowledge. And um, I mean, probably more than half of aviation is just the ground knowledge that you have to, that you have to memorize. So um, the memory from the aspect of classical conversations, I was a memory master for the four years that I was in foundations definitely helped. Um, and um, yeah, I, I mean, it was just crazy to see all my friends around me kind of struggling through these classes and stuff like that. And I mean, it was, it made college super easy. Now you got your degree in three years and then have you flown commercially or now you're a trainer at Louisiana Tech? Uh, tell us about, you know, from wanting to fly to now the work that you're doing today. Yeah. So, um, I guess for anybody out there who wants to be a pilot, I highly encourage that. Definitely. It's, it's an achievable dream. You can do it. Um, the, the first step is kind of what I said, you go to your local airport or a flight school. Um, you can do one or the other and, uh, start your private pilot training. That's about 40 hours of flying with, uh, with a couple like night flights in there and, um, solo flights kind of scattered. Um, and then, so once you're done with private, then you would move on to instrument. And that's what I did. That's what I started here at Tech. That's about 35, 40, 50 hours, uh, depending on where you go. And um, after that, you have the commercial license. So um, at my school, we're a part 141 school. And so um, that essentially that means mean? uh, so uh, <laughs> it's like the regulation that governs us, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, yeah. So you've got 61 versus 141. We're 141. Um, and so we can get our commercial license. I got mine at about 120 flight hours. Um, that's about the minimum. If you go to, um, a part 61 school, it's going to have to be about 250 hours. So quite a, quite a bit of hours there. Um, but after you get your commercial, you can get your CFI, uh, which is certified flight instructor. And so that's what I am today. I'm flight instructing at tech. Um, and, uh, so I guess my goal is kind of, to build up my flight hours, um, because to fly the, the regional jets and at the major airlines, you know, Delta and, and all of them, uh, you have to have 1000 flight hours to even for them to even consider you to, to get an interview with them. So yeah, I'm pretty much just building my time right now until I get to, uh, around a thousand hours. Nice. Now your grandfather, you said paid for your private, uh, air, airport license or pilot's license yeah did he make you uh help him around the house or anything like how was <laughs> how expensive is that and um you know did the uh, how is he holding you accountable yeah um well so it was always his dream um he always wanted to be um and that's why he got his private he wanted to kind of continue on and have a career in aviation but unfortunately he wasn't able to pass his medical he had like a heart murmur at the time um mm which has since cleared, but yeah, it stopped him from achieving, um, you know, going to the, making a career out of this. Um, so it was more of him. Uh, I mean, of course, you know, I, I mowed his grass every here and there, but, uh, um, it was more of, he just wants me to live out his dream. Um, as, uh, yeah, to, to live it's out your his dream, dream too, as, right? Well, no, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I've always wanted to do it, but I mean, he was just absolutely, elated when he heard that I wanted to be a pilot because you know that was, that was his dream. So it's kind of both. I'm living out his dream. Yeah. 
<laughs> I got gotcha. you. Yeah, talk about, uh, you know, your parents, were they encouraging you? I mean, it sounds like your grandparents were super on board, but were your, was your mom nervous about sending her little boy in a uh, plane and all the things that uh, could happen? Absolutely. I mean, um, anything could happen. It's, uh, it's, it's a little, it's a little scary. Uh, and I'm sure she was scared as well. I mean, um, my entire family was, especially my grandmother, she's always worried to death about me. Um, but, uh, they were nothing but supportive. I mean, they're, they're just all of the support in the world. Um, and I mean, yeah, that, that meant a lot to me that they would, uh, support me even though it was dangerous. Yeah. Now, did you, like, I can imagine that you had built a lot of trust up with your family before they would um, encourage and allow you to do that. So how did you really begin building that trust so that they felt comfortable, you know, as you were 17 or so um, climbing into the back of a, or front of the cockpit (laughs) rather? Yeah, no, yeah. Um, I mean, not to brag on myself, but I was, I was a goody two shoes you know um, okay. <laughs> no I I mean I, my parents trusted me with with pretty much everything um, they I got a job at Smoothie King whenever I was uh, 16 years old um, that's how I paid for a, a good portion of my flying uh, pretty much almost the entirety of my instrument rating um, so I mean I was I, I tried to be responsible and prove to them that I could be trusted and in return they gave me that trust so yeah it was nice. So what's the best smoothie at Smoothie King? <laughs> hmm. My favorite is the banana berry treat. And if you add some frozen yogurt in there, it's it just tastes so good. Well, that's really cool that you help pay for it yourself. I mean, I know that when you have skin in the game, as they say, you take things much more seriously uh, than if someone else, especially if someone you don't know is paying for it. Tell me a little bit about... Uh, you know, you're an instructor now and you've been, if you're, sounds like you were a better student than I was, uh, <laughs> but uh, you've been exposed to the classical methodology of learning. Has that um, method helped at all in your instruction um, as you teach other people to fly and trying to help them, uh, you know, memorize uh, the things they need to memorize? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the challenge three and four uh, realm, somewhere in there, um, the leading the discussions that was really um, instrumental in helping me um, with my instructing career because in in those years of challenge you start to um, lead the class and you have to ask good questions and you come you come prepared to class with a list of questions and um, you have to back it up with impromptu questions because I don't know I'm sure everybody's class is a little like mine they'll they'll start to stray off and it's like wait 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 yeah. we have to come back to the 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 topic at hand so you you kind of have to rope them back in with some uh, some impromptu questions and uh, that's definitely helped out a lot um, I, I mean half of my like I said, half of aviation is ground knowledge. So a lot of times I'm not even flying with my students. I'm sitting there on the ground with them and I'm just asking them questions and questions and questions and for almost two hours straight. And if they start to stray off or they don't, don't tell me the right answer, I got to bring them back over by asking some, some more good questions. Now, do you know if you're the youngest uh, pilot trainer or aviation pilot trainer at Louisiana Tech history or um, are they, or is that a normal pathway for you to graduate like that and immediately start giving back to, uh, other students? Yeah, it's pretty normal. Um, I mean, I guess it's a little abnormal that I was done a year early. Normally the, the flying portion and the classes are not too difficult. It's the flying portion that people get behind on and you can't graduate until you're done with your CFI, um, certificate. So yeah. Um, I mean, I guess I'm on the younger side, I would say, but, um, but no, I mean, it's, it's pretty normal that you pretty much graduate, turn around, get a job there and train up the next generation of pilots. Yeah. Now, what was it like that first time you went up all by yourself? <laughs> Terrifying. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll be honest with you. Um, a lot of pe- a lot of instructors do this to their student, but um, I remember we, we went up for like a, a 20, 30 minute flight and then he goes, all right, go pull on over to the parking area. 
It's like, okay, okay. So we go pull over there and he says, all right, keep the plane running. And he starts unlatching the door. And I'm like, what are you doing? He says, well, you're about to go up by yourself. You're going to do your first solo. And I'm like, I don't think I'm prepared for that. I mean, I had think nine and a half flight hours in a, in a small airplane and he just started getting out the airplane and i'm like oh my <laughs> what are you doing no and uh, he said you'll you'll be okay I, I i believe in you and i was like all right and i went and i did my landing and honestly it was probably one of my best landings i've ever done surprisingly but um yeah that was my first time nice and uh do you still get nervous when you're flying or is it now just kind of <laughs> normal operations for you? A little bit of both. Uh, everything is normally uh, pretty okay. I'm not nervous. The only time I get a little a little uneasy is on um, takeoff and a climb out. Um, they have something called the impossible turn. And basically if you're, if you're below a certain altitude, so normally about seven or 800 feet above the ground, it's impossible to turn your plane around and landed on the runway in time before you hit the ground. So on climb out, I'll get a little, they tell you just go straight ahead, whatever you can land on, just go ahead and land on it, whether it be a field or a road. So I get a little nervous uh, on climb out, but everything else is uh, pretty second nature now. Yeah. Nice. Now I know there's a major shortage of pilots in North America and I imagine around the world. You know, how serious of an issue is this uh, for you? And uh, what do you think is the cause of this shortage? Yeah, so, um, I mean, it's it's serious. It, it, it's not great. I mean, I'll say that. Uh, it's great for pilots. Had a lot of flights delayed. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, exactly. It's great for pilots, but for the passengers, yeah, all of those flights are getting delayed, canceled. Um they're having to, airlines are having to cancel routes because they don't have enough people to fly those routes. So um, it's bad in that that aspect. Um, I would say the biggest cause of this is probably COVID. Um, it was kind of projected for pilots to, to kind of dip down a little bit, the number of pilots to dip down, but COVID just kind of accentuated that a little more. Um, yeah, I, I would say COVID just because so the, the maximum retirement age for an airline is, uh, or sorry, minimum, whatever, 65 years old. They okay. force you out. You can't, you can't fly um, after 65 at an airline. Small airplanes, you can do whatever you want there. Um, but for airlines, they stop you at 65. And so when COVID hit, um, they had to furlough a bunch of people. Um, people left and they offered early retirements to all these guys and so those guys just decided okay yeah sure i'll i'll take the retirement money and i'll head on head on home um and when we started coming back around and we needed more mm -hmm. pilots again and people started flying again all of our pilots were already retired so yeah it's um there's definitely a very large shortage if someone's interested in learning more about becoming a pilot are there ways for uh, like a young person to go learn more about it? Is there things the aviation industry is doing to reach out to uh, people to try to encourage more and more uh, individuals to fill these needs? Yeah, definitely. Um, there's a, I'm a part of an organization called the, um, the EAA and uh, Experimental Aircraft Association. And um, I know in our local area, they have a, something called your Discover Flight. And so they'll take you up for free and just get you in a small airplane, see if you like it, see if you don't like it. Um, there's, yeah, there's countless organizations like this that are, that are bringing up these young kids in airplanes and trying to get them passionate about aviation. And um, I would say it's working. Um, yeah, you see that they get out the airplane, they got a big old smile on their face. Yeah. Yeah, I've been up a couple of times in small planes and it's both fun and terrifying. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> what um, what are some life lessons that you've taken or learned through this journey of becoming a pilot? Hmm. Yeah, um, I, I would say, and this is going to come off a little negative, and I don't mean it in a negative way, but um, expect, expect the worst to happen. I mean... Um, when you're up in a plane and you've only got one engine running and that one engine stops running, uh, something happens, you know, you lose oil pressure and, you know, it just stops. Um, you have to be prepared for that at, at all times. And that's something that um, our flight school does a good job of almost every single flight. Um, I, I know I do this to my students. I'll, I'll grab the throttle and I'll pull it all the way back and I'll say, all right, your engine has failed. What are you going to do? And um, 
and so yeah you just kind of have to expect the worst um you know in life um don't don't live in fear obviously of just everything's going to go wrong be, be prepared um, Exactly. Yeah. Keep some money in your bank account in case a rainy day comes around, in case COVID comes around, something like that. Um, so, yeah, just be prepared. Uh, be pre- pre- prepared for something to go wrong. Yeah. Now, how long do you plan on being a flight instructor? Do you have I mean, you've known what you were going to do since a very young age. So how do you have a prediction on your flight instructor career? Um, and it sounds like you want to eventually fly for one of the big airlines. Definitely. Yeah. Um, like I said, I have to get a, a thousand hours. I'm at 215, I think right now, somewhere around there. Um, so quite a ways to go. Uh, I would say probably about a year or two, somewhere in that range. Um, I'll have my thousand hours and then I can go um, and uh, try and get an interview with one of the big, big wigs. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Now saw a news article that uh, a lot of Air Force pilots are starting to see uh, orbs in the sky. So have you seen any identified flying objects while you've been <laughs> flying? I can't say that I have, no. Okay. All right. Now, uh, I hear you might be getting married soon. And uh, is your fiancé, did y'all meet in classical conversations, or was she homeschooled? Yeah. So, um Chloe and I are getting married in uh, December and uh, yeah, we, so I mentioned we started up our community and the year after um, we had a very small community. So we started uh, trying to get some people to join, um, get the classes a little bigger and uh, yeah. Yeah. So she came along the year after um, we were looking for a a closer church. The church at the time was uh, our, our church was 30 minutes away and going. 30 minutes there, 30 minutes back was kind of a, uh, it was, it was, a, it was a lot of gas. <laughs> so yeah. we decided we're going to look for a new church. And so we asked around the community and it just so happens that her family went to this small church near us and we we're like, Oh, we'll try them out. So uh, we went over there and we loved it. Um, and so, yeah, pretty much all of my, all of my social life, all of my time was spent with, uh, with Chloe and, um, yeah, so we we did class conversations for uh, nine years together, graduated together, and pretty shortly after we graduated CC, um, we went to colleges pretty close to each other, and uh, yeah, we got to, we got to, got together, and now we're gonna get married. It's pretty nice. <laughs> nice. How uh, how did you pop the question? Did you, was she expecting it, or did you surprise her? <laughs> I I did surprise her. Um, it's really it was it was kind of a challenge of mine because she, she said, Oh, you're not going to be able to surprise me. And so I, I took that as a challenge. Um, and yeah, I, I finally uh, got around to it and surprised her. Um, there's a local park around us and that's where I asked her to be my girlfriend. And that's where I asked her to marry me at the same exact bench. So, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Now, what is she doing? Is she, has she graduated college or you, you graduated early? So I wasn't sure if she was done yet. And what is, she, what does her life path look like? Yeah. So we just, uh, we both just graduated, um, at the same time and she is working at a local hospital as a surgical technologist. So yeah. Okay. <laughs> nice. Well, um, that's pretty cool. So you all went to CC what, nine years together then? Correct. Yes. Okay. Well, that is really cool. Um, sometimes we joke around that we should start a dating service between <laughs> CC people. <laughs> <laughs> well, what would you tell like a challenge student who might be entering challenge one or two? Um, what, what advice would you give them? About challenge or about life? <laughs> <laughs> ah, either one. Well, study hard. Um, take, take, uh, take your school seriously and uh, it's going to sound a little cheesy, but follow your dreams because um, I really didn't want to have, I didn't want to sit behind a desk or a computer or anything. I, I wanted to see, have a nice view every day. And that's, that's why I really pushed to be a pilot. I just, um, I was passionate about it. So my advice would just be to, to do what you're passionate about. Don't, uh, don't pick your second option just because you're scared of doing it. Mm. That's good advice. And what advice would you give to a parent of a, of a high school student uh, in, in challenge to what can they do to help their student become successful? 
just uh, same thing that my parents did with me. I guess I guess that worked out for me. So just uh, give them all the love you can and support them and uh, support their dreams. Tell, encourage them. Tell them uh, that they can they can do it. Yeah. Well said. Can you tell us a couple? You mentioned that one organization you're involved in, but if people want to learn about flying, about getting their private uh, pilot's license, um, what are some good websites or resources? Uh, for them to go visit and learn about that process. Yeah, I mean, just look up uh, wherever you are, airports near me, and um, check to see if your uh, your local airport has a flight school and reach out to them, call that number, and ask them what their next steps would be. Um, yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show today and telling us a little bit about yourself and what it's like to be a pilot. Definitely. Thanks for having me. Hey, everyone. Uh, You probably heard about the shipping strike potential with UPS and the Teamsters Union. That was averted with an agreement. But what is in that agreement and how does that affect you, the consumer? According to Tom Nightingale, who's CEO of AFS Logistics, it's a company that helps shippers negotiate prices with UPS and other uh, services. He expects the GRI, which is a definition general rate increase for 2024 to be close to 10%. Uh, So while it's great for the UPS workers, there's about 340,000 Teamsters, uh, this new agreement means that about 47% of UPS's $100 billion in annual revenue is going to be paying uh, these employees. And as we learn in Penny Candy, which is a book that we read in Challenge as we uh, practice and learn about economics, uh, we know that the customers are the ones who end up paying that price. And so uh, we hear from many people that inflation is going down and that the government's uh, increase in, uh, in, you know, in interest rates are helping with that. But uh, this is just another example of inflation being high in the future as uh, businesses and consumers deal with an increase in shipping costs. And of course, we'll see if UPS is able to continue to ship the same amount of packages or if there will be additional losses to employment there because the number of people purchasing and using UPS goes down as the price goes up. Until next time, continue practicing the tools of learning as you uh, read the news and are living out your daily life. Hey, have you ever wanted to hear from Lee Bortons herself uh, why she loves so many of these books? Well, you should consider joining her in her weekly book club called the Words Aptly Spoken Book Club. It's hosted every Thursday at 7 p.m. Eastern, and each week's meeting centers around a discussion of a new book, including Classical Conversations exclusives, like selections from the Copper Lodge Library series, as well as literary classics like The Adventures of Tom Sawyer and Mere Christianity. You do not have to read these books beforehand. You can join in without having read them and engage in thought-provoking conversation on the power held by words, ideas, and stories with other homeschoolers, parents, and lovers of books. Visit LeeBortons.com to find a live link to join the Words Aptly Spoken Book Club. That's LeeBortons.com, L-E-I-G-H-B-O-R-T-I-N-S.com. See you there. Welcome to Classical Crypto with Will. Today, we're going to cover a couple uh, current events in tech and crypto. And then I'm going to introduce a new thing on the show, which is I'm going to introduce to you a new coin that's maybe in the top like 20 to 50 cryptos as far as market caps. You can start getting familiar with some of the names and some of the functionality and real world utility behind these coins. So let's dig on into it. Uh, Bitcoin, just for a quick market watch, it's been sitting around $30,000 now, basically since the end of June. So we've been there for a hot minute. Um, June 23rd, I think, is when it kind of got up there. Um, So last week of June, all of July, and then the first two weeks now into August, so almost two months, it's been sitting around $30,000. Again, we're starting to swing up. I wouldn't be surprised if we dipped one more time before starting to climb steadily to that halving cycle. That halving cycle hits 
um, uh, May of next year. And then we'll start to see more of that parabolic activity or should see that parabolic activity going into the end of 2024 and the beginning of 2025 where it skyrockets. I do believe Bitcoin will be worth over $100,000 or six figures at the top of that next uh, bull run. I think that's actually kind of a conservative guess. So uh, we'll see what happens there. Additionally, other news that happened recently is end of July, Twitter rebrands to X. A lot of conspiracy around why that is, but it is done. Very interesting. I know I've talked a lot about XRP recently and the battle, the ongoing battle with the SEC and how they Ripple has delivered its first decisive uh, strike. They have not won the war, but they won a big battle um, against the SEC. After that, Ripple's head of payment products launched a proposal, which he has sent to the board of X, the board of Twitter. Um, apparently, the CEO of Twitter, of X, really likes the proposal, so now it's basically up to Elon. But the head of payments has proposed that content creators on X, they just don't make a lot of money compared to YouTube or some of the other platforms out there. And then the money they do make, make um, is just eaten away by fees and whatnot. So he actually proposed that X pays the content creators on the platform in XRP. How cool is that? X pays out in XRP. That would be fantastic. Basically, he said that would free up all the fees. So if there's $100 in fees for a payout, this would basically cut it down to like a dollar or something ridiculous. So that's pretty cool. It'll be interesting to see what happens now that crypto is uh, getting more regulations. Now that we have some insight into XRP, it might be a good choice for Elon to jump on board and make X a big proponent of XRP. I know that uh, I would be a fan of that. Uh, Chainlink is our token, the token that I want to cover today. We'll just briefly cover a few things on it. It was founded in 2014. Uh, Chainlink's real world solve is that it facilitates secure communications between Ethereum projects and other off-chain projects. So basically, Chainlink is a cryptocurrency token and the technology behind it helps Ethereum and other cryptos communicate together so they can work together. So it brings people together. It'd be almost like two different types of uh, coding software and then writing a language that helps them communicate so they can kind of build. So I see it as a bridge, right? Chain link, that's why they called it that. Um, fantastic project. I just like how it brings people together in the space because it can get, being in such a decentralized space, it can get pretty tribal where, oh, I'm Bitcoin and you're Ethereum, so we're enemies. No, everything, everyone, in my opinion, should be working together in the space. And Chainlink brings everyone together. Uh, Chainlink went from, in the last market cycle, uh, hung around $2 for a long time during the bear market. And in the bull run after the last halving in 2020, it shot up to $50 per token. It, today, it's sitting at $7.50. So again, it lost a lot of momentum, but that's what crypto does. It goes sky high, comes back down to earth, but stays higher than the last, the previous bear cycle. Goes sky high, comes back down sky high, but it's usually growing and Chainlink does seem to have a fantastic uh, base of people who really believe in the project and the token, and it seems to be doing really well. So thank you for tuning in to Classical Crypto with Will today. We will see you next time. Well, thank you for joining us today on Refining Rhetoric. If you've enjoyed these episodes with CC Challenge students, you won't want to miss the next one. Share this with a friend who might want to hear about the fruit of the spectacular education parents can give their children. So be sure to subscribe and we'll see you next week. Thank you for listening to Refining Rhetoric with Robert Bordens. Want more? Make sure to subscribe so you won't miss an episode. You can also follow us on social media to continue the conversation and visit classicalconversations.com forward slash rhetoric to find out how you can join a local homeschool community.